Let's prepare our hearts and mind to go into the Word this morning. And as we prepare to go into the Word, make sure you grab your Bibles and go with me to the book of Luke, chapter 10, specifically verses 25 through 37. I'm going to go to God for a word of prayer, and then we're going to dive into the Word this morning. Father, we ask that you would open our hearts to hear, open our hearts to receive, open our hearts to make the necessary adjustment toward your word. It is one thing when we say we know God, Lord, it's a completely different thing to put into practice the truths of your scripture. So Holy Spirit, as your word goes forth this morning, I am praying that it would be a word for the nations, God, particularly our country in these United States where we're broken, we're divided, we're hurting. And we don't know what it means to get along, especially in the body of Christ. My prayer is healing for the body of Christ. So as your words go forth today, may it speak to a person, a people, a nation, a country, that we would make the adjustments and be the people that God would have us to be. Amen. Let me start here. Why can't we just get along? That's a statement that's a lot easier said than done. You may have heard it from time to time. When we look at Genesis, in the book of Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, we find that God, when God created humans, he created them in his image and in his likeness. What does that mean? It means that as humans, human beings, we are all image bearers. We have the image of God within us. In regard to our interpersonal relationships, why can't we just get along? We all have the capacity within us to be like God, to love each other, to care for each other, to befriend each other, to be compassionate towards each other. If we look at Matthew chapter 23, verses 37 and 38, and the same thing is found in the Shema in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, we are taught the greatest commandment is this. We must love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind. And the second is like it. We must love others or love our neighbors as ourselves. The challenge as I see it is not so much with the first part of the command. We all love God. It's real easy for us to love God. It's easy for us to give God our hearts and to love God with all of our heart, that, that, that part of the command is not an issue, nor is it a challenge for everyone, anyone. The challenge, however, is with the second part of the command, love your neighbor as yourself. What I have learned about the command is that loving my neighbor is easy as long as my neighbor looks like me as long as my neighbor lives in the same neighborhood where I live in, as long as the neighborhood is the same ethnicity that I am, as long as my neighbor goes to my church, we have the same denominational affiliation. It is easy to love my neighbor so long as we love the same political candidate. We have the same values and we have the same political affiliation. It is real easy to love my neighbor as long as those character traits or characteristics are the same. The problem becomes loving my neighbor becomes a challenge when my neighbor looks different from me, when my neighbor does not have the same value systems that I have. Loving my neighbor becomes difficult when my neighbor don't uh, have the same political platform that I have, or maybe the same denominational affiliation, or maybe we've gone to different schools, or we live in different neighborhoods, or we were raised in different parts of the country. And I don't know if I said this, but we might have different ethnic background. That's the challenge when it comes to me loving my neighbor. But however, when we look at scripture, scripture teaches us that we have all been made in the image and the likeness of God. And we are mandated, let me speak to believers for a while, as believers in Christ to love each other regardless. But where we find ourselves today as a country, as a nation, even as we are celebrating Black History Month this month, 
loving our neighbor has proven to be a challenge within these United States, and my, I, might I even extend this to the world itself. According to Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, the scripture says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's goal is heaven on earth. And if you and I, the people of God, the believers of God, expect to get along in heaven, I believe God's expectation is you begin the work here on earth to learn to love each other and be who God would have us to be. So who is my neighbor? That's what we're talking about this morning. Let's find out. Because this scripture that I have that we're presented with this morning, it, it provides us a great illustration of who our neighbor really is. So I want this morning to read this passage in the book of Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. We're going to break it up in sections. And I'm going to spend the first part just exegeting or, or diving into the text, giving you some historical and cultural information. Then at the end, we're going to draw one application from this text that I'm hoping, um, if you want to know what the purpose of my message is, my hope is that it would change us and it would transform us and would begin a healing process of bringing the body of Christ back together again so we can be the people that God would have us to be. As we look at the text, the text opens up in the first few verses, verses 25 and 29, and it, it reads as such in the ESV. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, him being Jesus, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he, Jesus, said to him, the lawyer, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God, see the Shema, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength, your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus responded and he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Now, let me read verse 29, and I want you to, to park on verse 29 for a little while. But he, the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? Now, let me give you a little bit of information about this text as we dive into it. The text opens up by saying, a lawyer stood up. Now, what you need to know about this lawyer, this was not a lawyer like we know lawyers today. This was a person that was studied or astute in the law, specifically the Old Testament law. So the first five book of the Bible of the Old Testament, this individual was an expert. You can more than likely refer to him as a scribe. This person was studied. They were a teacher. They were a person uh, that had devoted themselves totally to the studying of the law. So, so the text gives us some pointed detail. In rabbinic culture, it was normal for when the rabbi would teach, he would be the one that would sit down and the students would stand up around the rabbi to ask questions. So notice what the text says. It says, and behold, a lawyer stood up. So the lawyer, he did not have good motives per se. This guy was endeavoring to tempt Jesus, to test Jesus, to put Jesus to the test. But notice what he does. He postures himself in the position of a student. He stands up in front of Jesus, and then he refers to him in the, in the Greek, Rabboni, or Rabbi, or teacher, teacher. And he says to him, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, Jesus, knowing who he was, Jesus is no dummy. Jesus is God incarnated. He's pretty billion. So notice what Jesus refers to him. He, 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 he redirects the question and he asks him, you are a teacher of the law yourself. You are a student of the law yourself. Matter of fact, you are thoroughly educated in the law. So here's what Jesus says. What does the law say? So what is written in the law? So in other words, I believe, young man, you can answer your own question. 
So notice what the guy does. He cites the Shema. He cites Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6, verse 5. It's also replicated in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 16. He, he cites this. He says, uh, the Shema says this. And if you're anything about the Shema, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord, listen to this, with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So the man quotes this to Jesus and listen to what Jesus' response to him. Wow, um, you have answered correctly. So do this and you shall live. In other words, love God and love your neighbor and you shall live. Now, that's simplifying the text because verse, verse 29 presents a challenge because the man just like culture today, was not satisfied with Jesus' response. So look at what verse 29 says. He, desiring now to justify himself, here's the, the, sermon of the, 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 the title of the sermon, who Jesus is my neighbor. No, you might be wondering, why in the world would a lawyer ask Jesus such a question? Why in the world would a scribe ask Jesus such a question? Why in the world would a teacher of the law himself ask Jesus such a question? Well, the basis for the question was in the mind of the Pharisees, in the mind of the Jews, in the mind of, of, of this scribe, in the mind of, of the average Palestinian resident, the, the, the term neighbor had limitations on it. And they wanted what this guy was doing when the text says he stood up to test Jesus, Jesus being a Jew, he wanted to see if Jesus in his definition of neighbor would have the same limitations that they had on their definition of the term neighbor. I'm hoping you're seeing where this sermon is going and I'm hoping you can see how this can apply to you and I a long way because here's what would happen. When you entered the Qumran community, they had restrictions on who a neighbor could be. They had definitions on who a neighbor could be, meaning that if there was such a person as a neighbor, they also had including in their definitions who was a non-neighbor. So in other words, if you were not of strict Jewish descent, even though the laws in Leviticus talked about loving your enemies and accepting aliens because you yourself were aliens in Egypt, even though the law spoke about broadening the limitation on what a, a neighbor, who a neighbor is and who a neighbor can be, within this culture, they had restricted the definitions and the meaning of neighbors to be only people who, let me go back to my introduction, who looked like them who believed like them, who worshiped like them, who voted like them, who lived in their same neighborhoods. And if you found yourself outside the boundaries of their definition of neighbor, you were not considered a neighbor. And so when they quoted Deuteronomy chapter 6, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbor like yourself. Here is the, they, they had a limitation on who the neighbor is. And so when Jesus says to this man, love the Lord your God and your neighbor has, as, as yourself, they wanted to test Jesus and trap Jesus. So they wanted to know, hey, Jesus, is your definition of neighbor similar to mine? That was the point. Who is my neighbor is where they were going. Who is my neighbor? They wanted to understand that carefully. So notice what Jesus does. He wanted now to take the limits off of the definition of who the neighbor is. And let me get ahead of myself and say this. As a body of believers, whether we are willing to admit it or not, we too have limitations on who our neighbors are. As people in Christ within Christianity, we have limitations 
on who our neighbor is and notice the result. It has created this great divide that we find ourselves in the midst of in culture today, especially in these United States. When you think about the fact that we're celebrating Black History Month and we're reflecting on the accomplishments that blacks have contributed to this culture, the question of who my neighbor is is pretty much divine like it was back in the biblical terms, specifically through Jewish lens and more specifically through the lens of this lawyer. So hence, we have this black-white divide. We have this Republican-Democrat divide. We have these social classes divide. We have these educational classes divide. We have these economical classes divide. So whether we are willing to admit it or not, within our mind, within our minds, within our minds, we too have limitations on who our neighbor really is. Is. So the question, who is my neighbor? I think it becomes time or it's incumbent upon us as believers in Christ to pay close attention to this text to begin the process of redefining who our neighbor is and more specifically to define it through the lens of Jesus Christ. So in other words, hear me say this, take the limits off. Take the limits off. Take the limits off. Take the limits off. So notice the text. Notice the text. So Jesus says um, in, in verse 30, so Jesus now begins the process of defining or redefining who a neighbor is, or better stated, he is communicating now to this lawyer and to the hearers who our neighbor really should be through godly lens. So notice how verse 30 says, and Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, don't miss the cultural nuances that's implied in the text, right? Um, this man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho meaning that that road to Jerusalem to Jericho was a treacherous road and it was a, a downhill trot and it was laden with caves where robbers would hide in the cave and depending on the time of day as people were going by, these robbers would no doubt attack these people and rob them and strip them and steal items from them. It is speculated that this man was probably leaving the temple worship and going home after a worship experience. Notice how Jesus is potentially nuanced into this lawyer who was a scribe or a person that was involved in the religious cultic system of the Jews themselves. He is hinting at their behavioral pattern. Don't miss this. He's communicating to how they behave themselves. So here's a person who just left church on his way home. And he was robbed and attacked by thieves. Now, notice the text. Notice the text. Look carefully at verse 31. Verse 31 says this. Now, by chance. Now, by chance, he says, a priest was going down that road. Notice the same words. Going down. A priest was going down the road. And when he saw him, notice what he did. He passed by on the other side. Don't miss who this young man was. He was a lawyer. He was a scribe, a person that was versed in, in the Deuteronomical law. He was versed in the laws of the Old Testament. And the priest, the priest now was an, a person of Aaronic descent descendant from the tribe of Aaron, right? And this person, the priest's responsibility, his job was the individual who was responsible to go into the temple, to enter into the holy of holies on behalf, listen to this, of the very man who was laying by the road that's beaten. Don't miss that, okay? The priest's job was to offer sacrifice in recompense or atonement for the sins of sinners. So if anyone was expected to help this man, it would have been the priest 
whose job it was to pray for the man. If anybody was expected to help this man, it would have been the priest whose job once a year it was in to go into the Holy of Holy on behalf of the man himself who was laid by the road. But notice what the text says. The priest was going down, meaning what? Remember what I said to you about the young man? He probably was going from worship, temple worship in Jerusalem, back to his home in Jericho. We don't know that specifically, but just go with me here and, and lock into this. The priest, who was the leader of the worship experience, he now is returning from the worship experience himself in Jerusalem, going down to Jericho, where the priest lives. So he is taking the exact same path that this person has taken. And notice what's striking about the text. If, if anybody were supposed to help, it would have been the priest. If anyone was supposed to stop, you would expect as you're listening to this story, when it says, by chance, you would say this in your mind, man, help is on the way. This man who is beaten is about to get help. And understand, the priest looked like the lawyer. The priest worshiped like the lawyer. The priest believed like the lawyer. I'm going to keep saying this. The priest voted like the lawyer. The priest had the same denomination affiliation like the lawyer. I'm going to keep saying this over and over again. The priest had the same belief system like the lawyer. But when he saw the man, notice what the text says. He glanced at him and then he went to the other side of the street and walked by as if he did not even see him. My goodness, he offered no assistance. Why? Here's what the priest said. He quickly surmised in his mind, this man is not my neighbor. My goodness, who is my neighbor? Asked the priest. Not this fella who is laying on the street who is beaten by the road. So what does he do? He crosses over on the other side, he neglects his call. He neglects his belief system. He neglects the word that he probably just taught. He neglects uh, the, the very God that he serves, and he overlooks this man, and he crosses over on the other side, and he ignores him. And then notice what the text says. Look at, look at the next verse, and it picks up by saying in verse 32, and likewise a Levite, okay? Notice this. When he came to the place, so in other words, the Levite himself was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho on the same road. So I want you to see the order. It's like this. The congregation member left the church first, right? Then the priest is second to leave, and he sees the man on the road beaten. The Levite, listen to who the Levite was. The Levite, my term, the wannabe priest, right? These were the worshipers. These were the ones that were responsible to help the, the priest in the worship experience. These were the individuals that were the candelabra. These were the individuals that were serving the communion. These were the aides and or assistants to the priests. These were individuals descending from Levi who were dedicated and given their lives solely to God. And their job was to aid the priest in the temple. So if I may speculate, as the priest has left, the Levite was probably left behind to put things in order, to secure the temple, to make sure everything was put back up. So the priest left before him, and he stayed behind to put out all the candles and to lock the door and to put the bread back up and to make sure everything was in order. Now it was his turn to leave, okay? And so the, the Levite leaves, and notice what he does. He has the same behavioral pattern that the priest exemplified when he encountered this person that was laying down by the road. Here's what the priest and the Levite concluded. Getting involved is outside the scope of my obligation and responsibility. So the Levite, like the priest, concluded, this person is not my neighbor. And listen to me carefully. They both chose to remain silent when they saw a hurting person as opposed to speaking up and getting involved and beginning the process of unifying the body of Christ and bridging the divide. They chose silence and ignored this man in his time of need. But the story doesn't end there. The story doesn't end there because I'm hoping you see 
I'm hoping you see the church before I can even go on to the rest of the text because this lawyer was, 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 was a Jew of Jewish descent and he's showing the church ignoring the needs of people, ignoring the needs of people who are beaten, ignoring the needs of people who are oppressed, ignoring the needs of people that they deem to be second class, ignoring the needs of people who don't look like them, who don't speak like them, who don't believe like them. I, you get where I'm going. Ignore Ignoring the needs of people when they see them in their context. Now, the text takes an interesting turn. Because so far, I'm pretty comfortable in thinking and assuming that the lawyer has no problem with Jesus' response until we get to the next scene. Now, this is important information. The Jews had what they call a tripartite system, meaning... There was an unspoken class system that went like this. Priests, Levite, and lay individual. Let me say it again. Priests, Israelites, I mean Levites, priests, Levites, and lay individuals or Israelites. There was a tripartite, one being the priests, two being the Levite, and the next being the Israelites in order... Of, of, of their class system. So everyone listening to Jesus tell this story fully expected, fully anticipated that the next person Jesus was going to bring on the scene would be the third person in that tripartite class system. And they fully expected that Jesus said, after the priest went by and after the Levite went by, then an Israelite came by. They fully expected that. But Jesus does this twist on them. He doesn't fall play into their class system. He says, a Samaritan. Now you tripping, Jesus. Look at the text. Verse 33. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, the Samaritan had compassion on him. Jesus, listen to me carefully, used the word Samaritan. This man, he's not identified based on his religious class, but his ethnicity is brought forth before the individual. Jesus opens up by saying, a Samaritan. He didn't say a Jewish priest or a Jewish Levite. He introduces this man based on his ethnicity. Don't you find that interesting? A Samaritan, he said. As he journeyed, came to the place where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went to him, notice what he did. He bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Verse 35, and the next day he took out two denarii and gave them, gave them to the innkeeper. And here's what he said, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when you come back. Now, you've got to lock into this. The, when, when Jesus brought up the word Samaritan, you've got to, you, you should have been there because I'm pretty much confident in saying there was a reaction in the hearers. A who? A what? No. They thought he would say Israelite, but when he said Samaritan, because you've got to know this about the history and the divide and the division between the Israelites or the Jews and the Samaritan, they despised Samaritans. They hated Samaritans. And most of you know the history and culture. They, they considered the Samaritans the half-breed. They, they considered Samaritans as not being authentic and not being genuine. The Samaritans had their own temple where they worshiped on Mount Gerizim because they were not allowed to be with the Jews in Jerusalem. There was a huge chasm and a huge divide. There, there was huge, uh, let, me, let me go, even though they worshiped, this is so paramount and so relevant and so critical, even though they worshiped the same God, there was a huge hatred between the two groups. There was a substantial and a large divide between the two groups that the Jews couldn't stand. There I say this, there I say this. It was as bad as it was back 
in the days of slavery between black and white. You had toilets that says whites only and toilets that says black only. And you had fountains that says whites only. And you had fountains that says blacks only. I, I, I hope you see where I'm going with this. You, you had restrooms and you had places on the buses that says whites can sit here and blacks can see here. Why was that that way? Because there was a huge chasm and a huge divide. And listen to this, blacks and whites were not considered neighbor. It's no different than when we look at our political system. We just went through a change in administration and the church is split right down the middle, Republicans versus Democrats. And the same thing is happening. One is treating the other as if they're Jews and the other is Samaritan. And there's no getting along. There is no talking. And that has infiltrated the church and the body of Christ is split right down the middle for the same reason. So they had no expectation that Jesus would say a Samaritan. The Samaritan comes on the scene. And notice what the Samaritan does. He takes everything he has. The text says specifically, um, he, 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 he journeyed, he went, and he took, what, two denaros, denarii. Okay, that's a lot of money. That's about three weeks, according to one commentator. Three weeks worth of food, okay? And that's like a third of a Palestinian family's budget, that they took to provide, that's a substantial amount of money. The Samaritan did that. And then he takes the person to the end and he invests more. Whatever it costs to take care of this individual, take care of him. Whatever the amount, it doesn't matter. He puts up whatever it takes to take care of this beaten man to provide for him. He does that. He comes to the man, he binds his womb, he anoints him with oil, he comforts him, he leads him on his mule, he takes him to the inn, he cares for him, and he's paying for everything. You've got to imagine what was going on in the minds of the hearers, the minds of this lawyer. Why would he do that, listen to me, for a non-neighbor, a non-neighbor? Remember with me, in their definition, neighbor had limits. So now watch the turn. This is heavy in the text. Verse 36. So Jesus says to the lawyer, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? The man's response is one of the saddest statements I have ever seen in the Bible. Notice what verse 37 said. It says, he said, the one who showed mercy. That's sad to me. That lawyer could not even bring himself to say Samaritan. He couldn't even bring himself to pronounce the man ethnicity, the man's ethnicity, he can't speak this morning, because he despised him so much. He hated the culture so much. He hated the group of people so much that he used circumlocution. He went a roundabout way of saying who the neighbor was versus simply saying the Samaritan. He could not say the Samaritan because it would mean he would have to diminish himself. And notice Jesus' response, even though the lawyer didn't say Samaritan. Here's what Jesus said. Then Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. In other words, young man, take the limits off of your definition of who your neighbor is. Here's how I started the sermon. We are all created in the image of God, and we all have capacity to love each other, take the limits off. I want you to hear me say that. If you're an image, image bearer and I'm an image bearer, we have the obligation to love each other because we are both made in the image of Christ. Okay, let me say this. Let me read this to you. Listen to this, okay? Our enemies, all cultures have stereotypical images of their enemies. The enemy is the other the one who is strange. Our enemy 
is also perceived to be God's enemy. Lamont Sagley writes, you can safely assume you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates the same people you do. This story destroys the Jewish stereotype of the Samaritan as enemy. But listen to this. But it's lost its punch over the centuries, right? Who in the Western world hates the Samaritans today, right? But here's the problem. If we were to substitute Samaritan for contemporary, for contemporary hatred, we would see the same thing. Let me tell you a true story. We just nominated as culture, we, the United States, our first woman vice president in the form of Kamala Harris. It so happens that it's Black History Month and Kamala is an African American with some Asian blood in her. So I went on Facebook and I said, hey, regardless of your political affiliation or whoever you voted for, let's celebrate for a moment history. We had the first woman vice president and then she happens to be the first black woman that's vice president. Let's celebrate. Needless to say, the comments begin. And it was easy to see the divide. Let me just say this. All my black friends, congratulations, praise God, hallelujah, celebration, so on and so forth. I'm not going to say all my white friends, but some of my white friends said this. They went down the who is my neighbor path. I don't care whether she's black or white, because she's Democrat, she can't be my neighbor. Remember my statement, let's celebrate not the political affiliation, but the image bearer, Kamala Harris, a woman made in the image of God. Let's celebrate what God did through her. And some of my friends could not celebrate her because of, let me go here, she was Samaritan and she was not considered a neighbor. This is striking. And needless to say, the conversation ensued and it got heavier and heavier. I kid you not, I had one pastor's wife, very prominent pastor in the city, went on my Facebook page and said this, the devil or Satan comes as an angel of light. Beware of Satan. And I'm asked the question, wait, we just had a bunch of believers conversing amongst themselves. Who is the reference to Satan being made? You see how easy we can demonize when, when, when loving my neighbor don't look like me, don't believe like me, don't live where I live, don't vote the same way I vote. We forget the truth that we serve the same God. We forget the truth that we're made in the image of God. And like this lawyer, we have limitations on who our neighbor is. And if you don't fall neatly into the same category that I do, I have limitations and you're not my neighbor. Take the limits off. Let me end the sermon this way. The point of the story is this. All image bearers regardless of their political, social, or educational, sociological, economical status, are considered your and mine neighbor. And listen to this. If we're going to inherit eternal life, we must know what it means to love God and to love people. And loving people means not some people, but all people. Everyone who bears the image of God is considered your and my neighbor. And to inherit eternal life, we better learn to love people the same way we love God. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, as your word has gone forth this morning, we thank you for what you're doing, for who you are. The words of a song say this, Lord our God, we humble ourselves and pray we seek your face and we're turning from our ways. And then we say, heal our land, Lord. Heal our land. And your word is clear. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves, seek my face and pray, I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins and heal our land. If we expect the United States to be healed, God, 
Let us take the limits off of our definition of neighbor and cross these partisan lines, denominational lines, racial lines, and begin the process of being like this Samaritan, not like the lawyer, like the Samaritan, and love people the way you love them. In your name we pray.